Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles, host of the Angelo Robles podcast and the Family Office channel on YouTube. I'm the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. We are doing something really, really special today that I've been dying to do for a long time. We're titling it, You're Graduating College, Now What? And this is going to apply whether you're in high school, beginning college, a year or two or so after college, but it probably is a little more focused from the perspective that I noted, but I think you're all going to get value out of this. I receive many, many inquiries every day uh, from young people, and not just those interested in business, finance, and entrepreneurship, really all walks of life, from high school to college to young adult, and effectively, probably the most common theme or question is a little bit of a look to the future in terms of what I do, uh, how do I quote unquote become successful, given some of my experiences as an entrepreneur, and really more importantly, what I do through Family Office Association, knowing hundreds, thousands of hyper successful people, are there some things over my uh, 39 years that I've learned? <laughs> I don't know, we'll find out. So I think an important thing to do is to ask yourself, how do you define success? Is it happiness? Well, what's happiness to you? Is it simply having foundational expenses covered and nothing wrong with that? Is it being able to help others so you're in a position to be able to do so, including financially? Or is it simply to accumulate certain things that may be important for you and that's fine? It may be a beautiful $20 million home in Malibu. So it's really gonna be important to define success however you define it. Some may call this discovering and moving towards their purpose. Who you are is not defined by what you do or how much money you have. If you're young, I think you're gonna learn that over time. So it's important to define success and have a time frame. However, I could guarantee you that definition, that definition of success and what you're doing for sure is gonna change. You need to know where you're going and effectively you need to have a process to an outcome, a game plan, a strategy, in terms of getting there. To streamline my guidance in this video today, and we do have a special guest, we're very fortunate, I'll get to in a second, I'm gonna stick somewhat to what I know, business, finance, and entrepreneurship. No, money does not buy happiness. However, I guess I'm a little more familiar with business, finance, and entrepreneurship than I am with happiness. So let me, let me stick a little bit to my knitting and what I may just know a little bit about. My special person today, and I wouldn't even call it an interview, he's just an amazing, creative, incredible thinker. And really he's gonna be a lot of the action pack that you're gonna get out of it today. And he's a return visitor, but never really in this kind of loose format. It is not gonna be overly structured. And that is J.J. Sowers. JJ, welcome on. How are you, buddy? Yeah, thanks for having me. Good morning, huh? Early, uh, early rise. I am, yes, and where you are in an hour time difference, that is true as well. So we're doing this as a private recording, not with a live audience, and we're just going to go at it. So, you know, let's get right to it. So if I'm using the verbiage, JJ, of, you know, you're graduating college, now what? Well, oh my God, my experience with Generation Z and the younger millennials is they have, uh, they're concerned about the future. They're concerned relative to what we're going through in COVID, uh, their political concerns and issues and all the challenges that we're going through in America and around the world. They do not appear to be as optimistic as generations that come quote unquote prior. That's been at least my experience. And they're often graduating from college, wondering if the experience for them uh, from the educational side was really worth it. And oh yeah, they're often looking at lots and lots of debt. Take it away. Yeah, I think too that um, when people are in college and they're getting ready to graduate, they don't really know what they want to do with their life. Like a lot of them are thinking, oh, what am I going to do with my life? Because they have these guidance counselors, they have parents all on them saying, you have to get a good education, you have to get a good job, you have to do this, you have to do that, follow like the game plan. But I don't think there really is any game plan anymore. There probably never really was, but things have really changed since like our parents' age where people would go to a job and they worked there their entire life. 
and get a pension. N nowadays, you have the gig economy. People work two or three jobs. They have side hustles. And I really think you have to find what you're passionate about and find what you spend most of your focus on and what you do well. And then eventually it'll be clear what your path is. Because I even think a lot of people from years ago, what they did when they were 21, 22, their first job out of college isn't what they're doing today now that they're older and it wasn't their career. So I, I really think that you gotta be flexible and just focus on improving yourself. Your best investment is in yourself. Focus on learning, develop your critical thinking skills, See what's going on in the world, form your thesis, and try to think a few moves ahead. The world is going to a certain place. I think it was Wayne Gretzky. He says, I skate to where the puck is going. Try to skate where the puck is going and have that fit you. Because copying other people isn't going to work for you. You have to fit what's successful to yourself. So kind of take a mental framework or a mental model, like Charlie Munger says, mm -hmm. and have, have that fit you. But you can't copy like Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg or anyone you see because if you try to copy them, you can't be them. You have to be your version of them, your best version of yourself. Absolutely. And that's like, uh, it's a fool's errand in terms of thinking you could do that. There is one Elon Musk. Now, are there certain principles and initiatives that he did and traits that you could learn from? Absolutely. Uh, and by the way, this is not just about, I want to be an entrepreneur. Actually, there's not going to be as much on that as you might even think. That kind of is its own subject, but we'll talk about it. It's like what your focus is and what you want to do kind of after school, getting a job, uh, how to invest, some of the value behind that, getting a side gig or a side hustle and what you would do with that. And then maybe expanding that and how do you exponentially grow that? My opinion with side hustles, which we'll get to soon. I mean, honestly, I think you should be making money on that from day one. Part of that's going to depend on what you're doing. So, you know, back to the college perspective, hey, colleges are great for, in my opinion, three reasons. One is gonna be the education. Now, part of that's gonna be, you should have some level of diligence going into the college you wanna to go to to make sure the majors, the professors, the college in general is gonna be what you want it to be. If it's not, then you should move on and do something differently from that perspective. But honestly, you get what you put into it. This is on you to be proactive in your own education. The other benefits of college, well, I think they're obvious, but I'll point them out. You get away from mommy and daddy and you become independent. And now this is harder during COVID for those incoming freshmen in the school, but you get a chance for social interaction. That's the human element that no computer AI program is going to be able to replace. Now you mesh all that together and that experience is what should make you a far different person leaving school, I guess you could say, than, than when you went into it. But I can't emphasize enough. It's really, really important that you take responsibility for your own education. And what would you say, you know, JJ? No, well, here's my opinion. I get hundreds of resumes. I'm not even sure why. <laughs> hundreds of resumes from college kids. I'll call them kids all the time, whatever, every month. They're all relatively proficient. To me, I'm going to give you an honest feedback, so hopefully you all can learn on this. They're boring for the most part. You're sending it to me because of who I am and my organization from a business finance and to some degree entrepreneurship perspective. And again, if you went to what I call a top 15 school, it's going to get a little extra of my attention. I don't know, five seconds, 30 seconds. Ivy League, Stanford, MIT, Vanderbilt, Duke, et cetera. And there's others, of course, international. But like school number 16 through 300, they're, they're all what you put into it. Don't make an excuse, but that really isn't going to matter as much to me. Your resumes are often boring. They're not telling me what you're going to do for me and my organization, and you're not being creative enough. You're not being as much of a self-starter. What have you learned in your experience of someone who what, like went to community college yet ended up doing what you needed to do to be a wonderful investor and be dedicated? How important is it to be a self-learner, to be a lifelong learner? Yeah, I think um, learning is the most important thing, you know, always be like, you know, how when children are born, they're really curious and it seems like the world or the adults beat it out of them. So when, when a little baby's crawling around, they're into everything, they have, you know, this awesome wonder. And then as people get older, they seem to try to conform and fit in and they're not as curious. But as far as. Mr. Sowers. Mr. Sowers, you. 
Okay, you're back. You froze up a little bit. Oh, so um, yeah, what I was saying was is um, having a childlike wonder, being curious is the most important thing and not conforming to the world because it seems like when the little babies come out, they get um, very curious. They're into everything. And then as you grow older, the world kind of beats it out of you. I don't know whether it's parents or well-meaning teachers or whatever, try to make you conform and fit into what they think you should be. So I, I believe you should always keep learning, be yourself. And as far as the resumes go to get a job or something like that, um, you have to stand out because, you know, you, like you said, mm -hmm. you get hundreds, if not thousands of resumes and they're all the same. They went to this college, Ivy League, it's, it's exactly. old. But, but maybe even if they did or didn't go to college, they talk about something else they did. Hey, I might have went to college for finance, but I taught myself to code. These are the courses I took online. Here's the coursework. This is what I did. You're like, wow, this person's a self-motivator, a self-starter. Or they may talk about, hey, I know there's ups and downs in everybody's life. This is how I overcame obstacles. This is how I learned. This is how I bounce back. This is how I adapt. And, and then maybe even offer to do something for you for free. Say, hey, what can I do to help you and your organization? Give me a test so I can prove that I'm a value. So they show they're adding value. And that's the kind of person, wow, this person stands out. I want to give them a shot. I want to hire this person. Or I even want to just talk to this person. Because a lot of times people will reach out and say, hey, will you talk to me? Will you be my mentor? And some of them are even bold enough to say, oh, I just want one hour a week. But then you know, they're just asking, asking, or not really telling what they can do or how they provide value. Or if you help them, how they can provide value to the world. Not necessarily you personally, but to the world. It's just like they're only interested in themselves. Yes. And again, I see so many of them and not that I'm really hiring, although you never know, I keep my options open. Uh, and sometimes I do pass it on to friends and occasionally something will stand out, but usually, so I could tell you what I'm looking for again, you know, maybe you're number one in your class, you graduated Stanford. Well, why are you reaching out to me? Um, you know, you're going to be something else, probably way better, but it's all about you in the resume, it's not about what you're going to do for my organization. And if you describe what you did, so here's what I would look for. Again, especially if you didn't go to that quote unquote top school. Uh, how were you a self-starter? You know, in today's world, the value of knowledge has been commoditized. Come on. I could go on YouTube. Hopefully you're watching this on YouTube and we'll learn. I could go on Google and I could get anything I want within seconds and I could learn. So how are you a self-starter and what value are you bringing other than knowledge in a human-centric interaction? Your emotional intelligence, your self-control, your creativity, those are gonna be like more and more important moving forward, especially as the future of work relative to AI, eventually quantum computing, robotics, it's changing the whole dynamic, not to get true off track, but I could tell you something that those computer and AI programs, which are all wonderful, and they're going to add value in many ways, assuming we do it right, but they can't tell me how an apple tastes. They can't tell me what love is. So one thing that I recommend to people is there's, there's millions of people taking business and finance. And great, you're going to get a foundational knowledge, but you've got to be a self-starter. But that is going to be harder and harder as a job moving forward for the most part. Maybe you should look into, again, that human element and also do something in psychology and philosophy. Become more intrigued in the arts, in your communication, your human interaction. You know, don't you agree that that's going to be often more important for many of us that are not technologists relative to that human element, how we work and collaborate with others and how creative we are. Yeah, I think a lot of people, what they do is, um, back to what we mentioned before, they don't skate to where the puck is going. So people try to get jobs like in, on Wall Street back in 2007, 2008, when that was already too much competition and basically you know, it had already come to pass. And now everyone's trying to go into technology and VC and computer programming, which are all great things. But unless you're one of the top data scientists or the top people in the field, there's so much competition now. How do you really stand out? So I kind of think the next big majors, the people who majored in philosophy and learned critical thinking and psychology, sports psychology, things like that, and even some kind of arts, it could be in some kind of painting or some kind of music. They're going to be the next big fields because the world's really evolving and we're really turning into a world of influencers and brands where everyone's their own brand and how you can market yourself, how you can be seen. So learning about things like that, it may even be marketing, maybe um, one to get into as a major, but not marketing as we think of it today, but like social media marketing, influencers, things of that nature, branding.
even learning about the gig economy, you know, how can I be very valuable? So anything that basically adds value that doesn't have a lot of competition. I mean, like many of you are familiar with Gary V, Gary Vanderchuk, and he talks about, you know, scraping his way up, working in his parents' business and making sacrifices, practicing self-control, wanted to go out and party more in New York, but knew that would take his focus off what a core inner purpose of him was and knew that he also wanted to save money and have flexibility because that really is what money provides. Uh, so he made those sacrifices for, you know, probably the most part of his 20s where many people are, and that takes no skill, no skill to do that. That is, well, a psychological skill of your, uh, your executive function, practicing self-control, which is why, again, psychology is oh so important. Uh, so many of you should just get out there and work. I mean, I was approached <laughs> about three or four years ago. The gist of it was it was an early stage of a reality TV show. Uh, and it was something along the lines of, you know, we give you $100, shorts and a T-shirt. We drop you off in a city and you got like 24 hours to get a job. And there was a little twist to that, you know, also, quote, unquote, get a date. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's actually, that's all easy. Now, COVID made it a little harder. I would basically just walk into restaurants and be willing to just wash dishes, do anything, just prove your worth to someone and start to save, start to build, start to have gold, start to work your way, quote unquote, up that ladder. Then you develop side hustles, which we're going to get to opportunity for you to flex your creative muscle, how to build companies that could start earning revenue and learning the discipline of saving and investing and how to invest and all these things that we're going to, you know, have a chance to get into. You know, you're big. And I know you talk about, and we're both huge fans, and we'll mention some books we're huge fans of in a second, but one of them is Robert Kiyosaki's work uh, about, you know, are you an owner or are you a renter? meaning not from a real estate perspective per se, but in terms of, you know, get out there, get a job, be dedicated, work hard. But then you have to make a decision what you're gonna do uh, with your frugal lifestyle, of course, in terms of, are you gonna buy assets that grow? Or are you gonna be someone who just buys things like clothing and experiences? And that's, th that's not gonna be the way that, you know, to borrow from Napoleon Hill, I guess you could say that you're going to think and grow rich. Yeah, it seems like too, a lot of people that they'll, they'll buy clothes and they'll have a closet for all these clothes that they either wore once or they never wore. So those are basically, you know, un unproductive. I mean, they might, they might consider them assets to themselves. But when I think of assets, I think of things that are going to appreciate in value, have a high probability of appreciate in value or kick off cash flow. So, you know, that's things like real estate, could be stocks, could even be bonds, could be things like cryptocurrencies. It could be starting your own business. Even that's an asset because um, building your own business, that can kick off cash flows and can grow to be an inc incredible thing. And even just investing in yourself in any way you can, that's an asset by treating yourself as an asset. So I kind of think your mind's an asset. So you have to take care of your mind by reading and thinking and learning th things of that nature. Those are huge. And again, you're making an investment in a growing asset. That growing asset is your earnings capability. So when you're really, really young, I'm assuming you have nothing in the bank, but you have your education and your drive and you have your earning capacity. And if it's working as a dishwasher, making three or $400 a week, that's better than nothing. You're at least showing gumption and initiative. And you're not going to do that 24 hours a day. You have time to be a self-learner. There's no excuses here. You come from a humble background. I come from a humble background. There's no Ivy League colleges. It's our internal drive and dedication and passion. And to simply make no excuses, I'll make the argument, you know, you, you come from quote unquote, like a hood type environment as well, that that could actually strengthen you and make you better at being persistent and learning true life skills that you need to learn. It's not all book knowledge in quote unquote, the real world. Talk a little bit about that. 
you know, I always call that like street smarts versus book smarts. Now, book smarts are important as far as being able to understand what you're reading, be able to communicate, be able to write, especially nowadays with blogging and doing newsletters on like a sub stack or something like that. And that can even be a side hustle where, where you earn money. But um, street smarts are really important. Being able to um, read body language, read people, get along with others. And I remember um, in community college, there was this guy I knew and um, he was really smart, book smart. But he would self-admittedly say he didn't have a lot of street smarts. And he would always say, sours, you have street smarts, sours, you have street smarts. And I remember there was some tests and we'd have this competition and he always wanted to win. And, you know, I was kind of like a little bit lax on studying for the classes because I was like, you know, I'm doing my side hustles, this, that, and the other. And, um, you know, I did what I could in class to pay attention enough to try to get like a B plus or an A. But one time we had this big test coming. He's like, sours, let's have a competition. And I was like, okay, let's have this competition. So so I actually really focused hard and studied. And um, I know they say 100 is, is the highest score you can get, but they actually had a bonus on this test. So he got 100 and I got the bonus right. And he was all upset for like months. I can't believe you <laughs> beat me, Sowers. I can't believe you beat me because I really focused on beating him because I was like, man, okay, well, let me show you. I can actually beat, beat you on this book smarts thing if I really applied 100% to it. Absolutely. Uh, so that just goes had... back to the focus. You get, you get more what you focus on. Right. But you made the decision that getting the better grade, you weren't looking for a corporate job. You were looking to refine, quote unquote, your side hustles, what works, what doesn't work in creating your own businesses. And you and I are like that. That's not going to be for everyone. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with graduated, graduating and kind of working your way into the corporate world. But here's what I will and again, it's your earned income. It's important to go, whether it's side hustles or not, from whatever, 20,000 a year, I know that sounds terrible, to 50, to 100, to 150. That's gonna be more important in terms of putting the money behind your education, investing in yourself, and investing in you know your side hustle businesses that again, we're gonna to get to, kind of should make money, at least I think, from day one. But Here's how it used to be a little bit more in my generation. You graduate, you get a job, you work hard, you learn, and you, you know, quote unquote, you save money in your company retirement plan. And there's nothing wrong with that. And in theory, that could work today. But I scratch my head a little bit, just the changing nature of jobs, the things I mentioned in terms of how the dynamic of technology and how that's all changing. And many of us might have multiple quote unquote careers, if I could call it that, over our lifespan. And I'm gonna challenge a little bit of some status quo thinking. Well, yeah, you know, you wanna save in your company, quote unquote, you know, 401k or pension plan. That might be a good strategy if you're getting a great match. And I know you think you're getting the tax benefits, but if you are investing in side hustle businesses that throw off money for yourself, I think that's going to be more critical. And if you're investing in stocks and real estate that are already tax favored, you have some level of greater fluidity and liquidity and control than you may have if it's in a more limiting, quote unquote, corporate plan that will have penalties and tax implications if you wanna utilize that money for other purposes or businesses. And again, certain assets like stocks and real estate that are already relatively tax favored. We're not gonna do a deep dive into that and get into some of the Roth stuff and th that could be better. But what I am saying is how about this? Think for yourself, don't assume the status quo that my father did it, my older brother did it, my older sister, whatever things are changing, would you say that's happening exponentially? Like, it seems like every day, JJ, things are changing. What worked in the past may not work anymore. Yeah, innovation is moving so fast with Moore's Law, Wright's Law, and things of that nature, that um, if people don't roll with the times, the times are going to roll over them. So you got to keep learning, adapting, keep growing. And one thing I think is really important too for young people is the habits you form as a child. So you got to form good habits of discipline and psychology and self-control. And even when you start out, I mean, you could be a little kid and you could start your own business just buying candy at the store, packs of gum and selling the pieces, you know, inside the pack, the other kids and just make a profit and keep reinvesting the profits. And then when you get your first job, like back when I was a teenager, you had to get a work permit. You could work at like Burger King, and Little Caesars, places like that I worked. You, know, you form the habit of taking a certain amount out of your paycheck. And they used to call that pay yourself first. I remember reading in some kind of book and they would say, you know, at least 10%. And I thought to myself, well, what if I save 50% or 20%? 
eat as much as I can. But basically, you know, when you get out in the world and you have living expenses, you still you can um, save a lot more than your um, lifestyle and invest it. So when I say save, don't just put it in cash because nowadays cash doesn't have any interest. You're losing purchasing power due to inflation. Who knows what inflation is going to be in the future? We haven't really had a lot of consumer inflation for years, but it seems like it's starting to happen. So you have to make sure you invest that money in assets that keep up with inflation and hopefully outpace it. And um, as long as you keep saving and saving and investing over time, it really compounds and eventually you get the snowball effect. And eventually what happens is, is your um, investments and your saving are kicking off more cash flow than your living expenses. And basically you've escaped the rat race. I think it was um, Kiyosaki who talked about escaping the rat race. I'm sure many others have too in books I've read, but I think that's really important because then it, it frees up your mind to think, be a critical thinker. And you're basically not like, an indentured servant to your job. I think that really makes a difference. What you said is just so critical that I hope people really got it. Now, yeah, maybe you're not going to be the Elon Musk, the entrepreneur, but you're still going to be someone who's going to go into the workforce. You're going to make money. You're going to save money. You have to know how to properly invest money. Now, here's the key. You're investing in assets that we hope appreciate in value, the right real estate, uh, stocks, uh, your own side hustles, businesses, et cetera. You need to be at a point, and this may not happen in two years. It may take 20 or 30. It depends on so many factors where your assets are kicking off more money or could be than the income you're earning at a job. Now you have the flexibility to get rid of that job because you built up assets and resources that are making you more than you would get. Really, really important here no matter what, that, that I hope you understand. Get in that workforce, provide value and learn. Do side hustles as you can. Manage your expenses and buy, buy, buy assets that go up in value. It's not a great name to bring up at the moment, but the young ones would get it. As simple as Robinhood, use your phone. You could set it up in seconds or similar services. Start doing a little bit of research and start knowing. And we're gonna talk about some things including Bitcoin, Tesla, and stuff like that. You know, be proactive. This is your life. Wake up, start to take action. Don't just sit back. And we kept on, you know, I probably mentioned a couple of times, you got to be able to think for yourself. You know, one example that I give as a side hustle is someone who wants to like mow lawns. Well, is that going to make you a millionaire? Well, actually it might, if you're willing to give it enough time. But how about this? You, you start from nothing. And you work and you get gigs just to get the experience and get some cash flow, be cash flow positive. And then maybe with the right marketing and social skills, you bring on other people. So now you could manage more lawns and landscaping. And now you're building a business that is strategic. It's not even just you as a side hustle. And of course, you're strategically showing discipline and saving that money and investing it properly. So again, you could have, you could be that millionaire next door, although a millionaire is not quite what it used to be back probably in my day, going back a while ago. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, side hustles. So I'm trying to think of someone who's Generation Z, they're younger, like they should really, really be fluid in social media, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, the value of being a self-learner, the value of these are all things that are free that you could become that next quote unquote person. So now imagine yourself, why don't you approach what you and I call old fashioned analog, like solo entrepreneurs, doctors, dentists, et cetera. Maybe they're in their, I don't know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And why don't you just go for it and say, hey, the world is changing. I could help you in a way that others can't. Here's what I'm willing to do. And it's going to make a direct impact on your business, probably within 30 to 90 days. How would you go about that? Yeah, I have this view that the world is going from analog to digital. And a lot of the older generation doesn't really understand how to use TikTok. They and don't. Things like period. that. But it's an older, like 30 year old. <laughs> but it's becoming more and more and more important to be relevant. And especially with COVID now, the businesses that were able to um, flourish on e commerce and do things with social media, some of them are actually doing better than they were when it was just um, brick and mortar because they have better margins. So, really, a young person, they could be. 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, it really understands TikTok and things of that nature, could even go 
around to businesses once COVID ends and um, say, hey, um, have you ever thought about a plan? How are you going to do your social media? How are you going to do your TikTok? How are you going to make your business grow? And they could really think something, learn something about their local businesses and be like, wow, put together like a little one page or whatever, and then just either leave it at every business and the family could respond and actually go back and ask, ask to talk to the proprietor, the owner, and things of that nature. And of course, there's going to be some rejection, but that's fine because every no you get brings you closer to the, to the yes. So let's just say like a baseball, three out of 10 is 300. A lot of those people are in the Hall of Fame. So if the first four are no's, you're like, okay, don't get all discouraged. You say, wow, now out of the next six, half of them is probably going to be a yes, just at a sheer probability. And then even the next couple of no's, you're like, now, wow, now I'm, I'm even closer to the yes. And then finally you get the first yes and you learn and you grow and you get excited, you get the next one. And the more excited you get, people feel your passion. And you just build the business up. And you could even just start and say, hey, if, if no one will give you a shot, just find a local business owner that maybe someone in your family knows or one of your friends knows and say, hey, give me a shot. Let me even just give you like one free sample of what I can do. And then when you go and do that and it's successful, now you have like a resume or a portfolio that's not the, like the typical resume. And you go and share that to these other business owners. Hey, look what I did for this guy and his business. I can do this for you. Why don't you give me a shot? And, um, you know, I'm going to do it at a discount for the first time for you so you can see how it is. So you, you may start with one person free and then the next person as a discount and you start building up your book of business and then you start having regular prices and as they're succeeding, you're succeeding. And the more they succeed, now they need you. It's a hassle to rip you out and get rid of you because you're growing their business. So you can start raising the prices and then you can even come to them one day and say, hey, um, you happy with the job I'm doing? Let's explore other ways to work together with the social media and really help and craft your brand. And maybe you can even be, start becoming an owner. Say, hey, can I get like an equity stake in your business? Mm -hmm. Because there's a difference between an owner and a worker and get that owner mentality. And even though it's not like a big business that's going to be like a big stock that becomes billions of dollars, even a local business, if you're just earning an equity in that business, even if they're not paying you a distribution, when they go to sell that business or retire, maybe you take it over or maybe you just learn how to run that business and get real friendly with that owner and learn how they think. And I always say, when people tell you something, though, don't just take it at face value. You have to say, why is that person telling me this? One thing I learned growing up, does this person have an angle? You know, are they saying it because of where they sit? And maybe it's good advice, maybe it's not. But you always have to say why. Like Even when you see the media say something, why are they saying this? Why are things happening? Because I believe we live in the greatest time ever with technology, that the opportunity for democratization and becoming extremely wealthy and the next billionaires, everyone has that chance. Now, granted, in some neighborhoods where you're born or grow up, it's harder than others. But if you can find your way out and just get that little one stroke of luck, I always say if you increase your sphere of luck, something good eventually is going to happen due to sheer probability. So we live in the greatest time ever. Yeah, I mean, the you example I gave, of it. you know, kind of what the landscaper, that is going to be a little bit more grounded in your local community. And that has charms. And for some of you, could be the good fit. And absolutely. When I was in Palm Beach <laughs> about two years ago, I bumped into a landscaper and I'm pretty social. We got to talk. He goes to get in his car. Uh, and by the way, it was a Rolls Royce. And he built an amazing business coming from nothing and again, like I said, uh, being able to properly market, being able to hire people to do the work that he manages and really focuses on building the business and was really, really successful. So all you want to be landscapers, go to Palm Beach, Florida. That's the place to be. Uh, now, what you described in terms of that digital perspective, you could really do anywhere in the world. There's no excuse. There's no reason why that you can't build that social media agency just take the initiative, get used to rejection. That's part of life. And not be a millionaire probably sooner rather than later, because you're going to be exponentially growing in the way that you described. And let's just say that you're a creator. And I'm not saying this is easy. If it was, all would be doing it. But I think the steps are easy. You just don't want to do it. But if you're a creator, create the niche content, build a community as an artist, be fluid on social media have an opportunity to learn how to grow and expand via TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. And then what you do is you build that following, which you're doing effectively for free for the most part. And there's a variety of strategies that you could do. And then you upsell people to like a Patreon, where as a creator, they're paying you whatever, $3, $5, $10, $50 a month. You know, do the math on something where you have being a little generous, but a thousand people paying you, you know, $19 a month. That is real money that you're not producing 
for each of those people individually, you're doing it once. So whether you have one paid subscriber or 10,000, it's the same amount of work. You wanna focus on getting more paid subscribers because you're gonna make a hell of a lot more money for doing the same amount of work. Now let's just say you tell me, well, Patreon and this, I don't have the knowledge to do that. Well then acquire the knowledge. You don't need to go, it helps if you have a good professor in school, but what schools really offer that? You know, just go ahead and learn. Be a self-starter, be a learner. You could do it. There's no excuse even if you can't afford school. There's always going to be things that you could do. Uh, let's, okay, so let's assume that they're doing this, JJ. And like we said earlier about showing self-control and discipline and saving money. And now they want to, they want their money to work for them. They want to own growing assets. Uh, you're you know, super knowledgeable about stocks and equities. Uh, so, you know, what would now, yeah, if they don't want to do the research, then maybe just being beta and investing in an index fund definitely beats doing nothing, at least in my opinion. But I know the young ones today, they're socially aware uh, and there's things that are important to them. And this actually is a bit of a stock picker's market at the time we're talking. Uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about you know, the technology driven stocks, but I really want to focus on one company. And again, dynamics could change, who knows? But I mean, look at an amazing company like Tesla. Oh, but the experts said it's overvalued. They've been saying that for years, the damn thing keeps on going up. Why? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's interesting because the, the retail investor in the last decade has quietly gotten a lot of things right that the professionals haven't. They got Tesla right, they got Bitcoin right, I mean, they've got a number of the what they call cult stocks, right? Beyond meat, things of that nature. I mean, they, the experts, because they're thinking of the old discounted cash flow textbook stuff they learned, you know, in school. And that doesn't necessarily apply 100% of the time. Those are all great knowledges and great things to have. But really, at the end of the day, it's supply and demand, more buyers than sellers in the stock market within the market infrastructure. So if you have more people buying something and selling it, it has to go to the next bid. It's going to take the price up. If somebody's selling it, more people selling and buying, it's going to drop to the next bid of the next buyer. So, so you really have to understand market dynamics. But really, the retail investor has gotten a leg up because with technology, they've all gotten together and done research. They've posted it in forums like Reddit. They, they've done YouTube videos. And of course, you got to do critical thinking. Why is this per person saying it? Does this make sense? But there really is something to say about the wisdom of the crowd when all these people have researched Tesla and they've said all these great things that they understand, hey, this car is great. You know, it's the future. Elon Musk is the um, Thomas Edison of our time. And then you might go on other things on the internet and read about how people who are scientists that really understand the technology of electric vehicles and the batteries and the components and say, wow, this is what they're saying. Because the people on Wall Street are just saying it doesn't make any sense based on Tesla's earnings and they say they don't have any profits, you know, their PE ratio is infinity and things of that nature that they said for years, not really thinking, well, what's the big opportunity? Like I always say, what's the yes if? If the one thing goes right, how big could this really be? How big is the opportunity? I mean, the opportunity is unlimited for a company that changes climate change. And suppose Tesla becomes the car where their software is in every electric vehicle because they're so far ahead of GM, Ford, and all of them that they, they may have to capitulate and say, you know, we tried to catch up to Tesla. These are our electric cars, but it's just inferior. We need the software. And maybe Tesla white labels that software. And now it's in 90% of the electric vehicles. And it's a subscription as a service like autonomous as a service or something like that. I mean, how valuable could that be? Like the way that Apple turns on the, you know, the subscriptions where you have to subscribe to the iCloud and the different things. And I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot of someone's paying a dollar or three dollars with Apple, but when you know hundreds of millions of people start doing this, this is an enormous revenue. And in the case of electric vehicles, it's my belief with autonomous vehicles that we're actually not gonna have as many people driving. They may not even get driver's license in the future. It'll be these robo autonomous fleets, but still, Every car maker is going to need the software that works for this. So if every vehicle has this and Tesla is the white labeling software, I mean, just, just imagine that the revenue stream could be turned on. And they're not only doing that, they're doing stuff with um, energy storage. You know, they purchased Solar City, so they're going to have things in your home that are energy efficient. And suppose they figure out a way this energy is stored and goes back into the grid and they can use that to power things. And that generates a revenue. I mean, it's unlimited.
I mean, and I always think too, people say, well, Elon Musk is running all these companies at once. I actually think he has a master plan where all the things he was doing ties in, that the boring tunnel ties in with a Tesla fleet that's driving people. And it may not be cars. It could be even like electric buses or something that we haven't thought of that's really cool that takes him from California to Nevada, you know, really fast in hours, like an hour and a half instead of, you know, I, I guess it's like maybe six or eight or maybe 10 hours, depending on where in California you're going, but it just takes you there really quick. And then Neuralink, connecting your brain to the internet, be, even be connecting our brains and our, our thoughts to the autonomous vehicles. I mean, I know this sounds outrageous today, but it, it really could be a thing. And just like with SpaceX and the rockets and going to Mars and the satellites with Starlink, all that could tie into Tesla. Absolutely. I mean, uh, apparently you and I are big fans and apparently the professionals don't quite get it. It's the young ones that are doing their, they're seeing things from a different lens and doing their own research. They're making their own decisions. It's not to say it's always going to work out that way and maybe you lose everything. I mean, we're not finan financial advisors, who knows, but look at it. And they're the ones who tell me this. It's a climate change company. It's a tech company. It's a big data company. It's a car company. Look at the future of robotic taxis, you know, that it, autonomous vehicles. Tesla is going to have such a huge, huge, huge leg up. That's going to be a massive opportunity uh, for this company longer term, at least from my perspective. And if you, how about this? I'll even give you another tip. Focus on companies with great potential, be a long-term investor. Tesla is an example. Why don't, and speaking of someone who self-learned, go to YouTube and go to like Tesla Daily. Look at what that person puts out. Look at the quality of subscribers they have and probably what they built, maybe on Patreon that I mentioned earlier and other ways they can monetize it. You can monetize that if you have enough subscribers and views on YouTube as well. And we're going to get to the influencer market. That's going to be a big focus of JJ and mine. So coming up shortly, Bitcoin would be another example of Beyond Meat because a lot of people are vegans now and the potential of that because it tastes so good. Uh, I would look into, although not on the US markets yet, a public markets, but in Canadian and other psychedelic stocks could be another example. Uh, so there's multiple platforms that make it really, really easy, easier than ever, and super cheap in terms of investing. Uh, we're probably not going to focus on real estate, but there are some tremendous leverage opportunities and those that are going to be very local and geographic in a given market that may for them be a better fit. We're actually going to do a stocks versus real estate discussion, me and JJ, probably in a week or two. So stay tuned on that. Let's talk about some books, some classics even, that were important to us. So we mentioned Kiyosaki and Rich Dad, Poor Dad. What are some others that you like? Um, Think or Grow Rich. I think you had mentioned that briefly. That that That's a great book. And that you know, talks about... Um, you have to provide value to the world. You have to have a definite purpose. And then once you put all your focus in that definite purpose, it seems that the universe brings all the pieces of the puzzle to you to succeed. There was a book, um, As a Man Thinketh, great book that I kind of got out of that. You become what you think about most of the time. Also goes back to what you focus on, you, you get more of. There was um, back in the day, a book, um, The Millionaire Next Door, um, Thomas Stanley. And like you said, now a millionaire is middle class. So maybe it should be the not even, not even the deck of millionaires even really that rich anymore with so much money in the system and all the rising of assets. Mm -hmm. So maybe it now has to be the um, centi millionaire is the, <laughs> is the really rich guy. But books like that, um, there's a book, Charlie's Almanac with Charlie Munger. Great. I mean, there, there's a lot of great books and just learning about history too. So you can see what happened in the past. And even though it doesn't exactly repeat, you know, people say it rhymes and you can kind of get the patterns. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just a lot of great books out there. I mean, it's, I mean, I would add maybe I mean, one depends more. Depends on what your interest is, but. Like maybe The Richest Man in Babylon. Was richest Man in Babylon. Book. Yeah, Richest yeah, Man yeah, in Babylon. Really well, really well, The Wealthy Barber. There was one, yeah. The Wealthy Barber. I yeah, remember reading. back from the 90s. Um, How to Be Rich, J.P. Getty, great book. And there were some books where I, I can't remember exactly which book it was, but I remember reading about how the Rockefeller's grandson, he was in college. And it was really funny because he was allowed to be given any money he wanted for expenses, but he had to account 
count for every dollar. So he had this little back in the day because we didn't have iPhones and stuff. He had this little notebook where he had to write down every expense and he would be buying sodas for like girls in the class or whatever. And everyone would thought, think it was funny because he would put the quarter into the dime, whatever it was for soda. And he would be writing down this expense soda on there for so-and-so. And everyone thought that was ridiculous. But the reason he had to do it because his um, parents said, hey, we're going to give you any amount of money you need for your expenses, but you better account for every penny. And the minute you don't account for every penny, you're cut off. And they were teaching him, you know, about knowing what you spend on, knowing your habits. It, re it really helps. I mean, to this day, I still, now I use the iPhone. I used to write it down a piece of paper. I, I, tra I track expenses, what I'm buying, what I'm spending on. And sometimes yeah. you'll see a pattern like, wow, I've really changed my habit. I started wasting money on this, that, or the other. I got a little crazy on this, that, or the other. And you got to gotta rein yourself back in. Because, you know, money is supposed to work for you. You're not supposed to work for money. And the more money you have working for you and compounding, the freer you are. Because it's not to be rich and say, hey, I'm rich. I'm doing all this. I'm doing that. No, to you want to have a certain amount of money for freedom because then you're free to make your own choices. And then to get to a certain level, like the billionaires, where you can have influence and you can put your point of view on the world. And I'm not saying other people's are wrong, but I think there needs to be like a diverse amount of opinions and views that are actually heard, actually put influence on the world and then let the world and the crowd decide what's for them and what actually plays out. Yeah. And just to give you a little bit of insight, what's coming up, we're definitely going to talk about influencers, about side hustles, and we're going to actually give some examples from a fitness trainer to multiple different perspectives about ideas that we would have and not saying it's easy, but just to spark your creativity and interest and give you the gumption. So stay tuned. That's coming up. Uh, one thing that will cover kind of two things at once from your being young and your investing money as well as the resumes I get in the world of finance, if you're young and you're not fluid, not just on the nuances of like a Tesla and what the so-called professionals on Wall Street are missing and hedge fund managers are missing, that you could do the right research, the things that I noted, look to the future and see the potential long-term, but where you would impress me is your fluidity on digital assets. And that's far more than just Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is definitely important. It's blockchain, it's other cryptos. Now we're going into another real sweet spot, uh, JJ of yours. You know, talk a little bit from that perspective about how decentralized finance and the future and how things are changing so rapidly. Teach an old guy like me and then your resume is going to get my attention. How could you benefit me? Yeah, so I think we're really moving from analog to digital. So even ourselves are going to become digital. We're going to have our own digital avatars, which may be on the blockchain that actually uses an ID. So instead of like a social security number, we'll have our own blockchain identifier or whatever and then we'll have like an avatar to even unlock things so there, there could be a wallet that we specifically have a jj token an angelo token and that wallet is used to identify us because it, it sees our token it reads a smart contract and gives us access to certain things and then we're going to move into a world of um nfts non-fungible tokens mm -hmm. and things where you can verify that something is truly authentic because nowadays you know in the physical world there's a lot of counterfeit this and counterfeit that but just imagine eventually with digital footprint you'll be able to um, have certificates of authenticity via the blockchain and um you know art's going digital a lot of people don't realize they think it's a fad or, or it's niche but a lot of these nfts now are really becoming valuable. I mean, things were bought for $9 on this thing called Top Shot and um, the LeBron James sold for over $70,000. And yeah. it's pretty cool because it's some um, kind of taking a moment and digitizing it on the blockchain, on the Flow blockchain actually with Dapper Labs. And I mean, there, there's a lot of things in the future. It's just, it's unimaginable how the future is going to be because right now a lot of the NFTs are just, you know, a collectible and it's static. It doesn't do a lot. And in five or 10 years, people are going to be like, wow, I can't believe we actually liked NFTs that didn't do anything. They're going to become interactive. It's going to be incredible. No, no doubt just about digitizing it. Your, your, digitizing someone's self, even like your resume could be digitized in a way that it actually shows you in action actually performing something or doing a task if that's what's needed. Or it's also going to be like authenticated. So you know how some people kind of like to, um, I guess, puff up the resume a little bit. But it'll actually be verifiable from your old employee. There may be employer, there may be a stamp that shows, hey, digitally, yes, this person worked here. This is what they accomplished. These are the goals they did. 
and it's going to be verifiable. I mean, we may be five or 10 or 15 years away from that, but I really believe we're going there and just, you know, money is going to become time stamped. It's just going to be central bank digital currencies. I mm -hmm. mean, everything is going to be used by technology. And if somebody who's older says, oh, I don't need to know that, you know, I'm used to my old way, it's going to become a time where everyday life is going to require this technology. I mean, you might, you might actually need like some kind of smartphone to even go buy food or to do any commerce and even to get into your house because um, the homes are going to become smart. Everything, the cars, the homes, everything's going to be connected to the internet. And if you don't just have a basic understanding of how this works, you don't need to know the tech behind or anything, but just a basic understanding on how to do this and access this stuff, you're, you're going to be in deep poo-poo for lack of a better term I mean, because the whole world is going to become digital. I mean, are you guys getting this now? Yeah, there may be little elements you would learn in college, but this is, I'm not even sure in five or 10 years, if they're going to have this, you have to be aware of this. You have to self-educate yourself. And I got people in their fifties or sixties that are doing it because simply it's all available for you to learn about, to make your own decisions on. If you're not familiar with the digital assets and how things are changing, central bank digital currencies, non-fungible tokens that you mentioned, the blockchain, digital art, these are all ways for entrepreneurs to make money. Imagine being someone who advises on these to, I don't know, to hedge funds, to investors, there, these are all the myriad of opportunities for you to start something from nothing. You don't need brick and mortar. You don't need a lot of money to do this. You practically need nothing, nothing. You just need to have a game plan and then just go out there and do it. So you talk a lot about kind of four pillars of success, critical thinking, non-conforming, having a childlike wonder and first principles thinking. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so critical thinking, you know, basically I always say, you know, what I've learned and observed is when 99% of people believe things, a lot of time it's incorrect. So then you have to say, go back to first principles. Why are they believing it? And then, you know, having a child want, like wonder, you have to be curious, wanting to learn things to even make you curious enough to say, okay, this person's telling me this. Why are they telling me this? Because you really have to think for yourself. Because um, a lot of people, um, I'm afraid, just conform because they feel like they fit in that way. And it's easy to conform because people have expectations of you and your life. But if you follow everyone's expectations of you, you're not living your own life. You're mm -hmm. almost like um, a prisoner to what they want you to be. And how is that going to make you happy? Because it goes back to something in the beginning. You say, you know, money doesn't buy happiness, but money can, can buy can buy keep you from having unhappiness, buy off unhappiness <laughs> and give you choices until you find what makes you happy. So it, it doesn't buy happiness, but it buys off unhappiness for a certain period of time and gives you the ability to use critical thinking, to have a clear thoughts in your head, use your childlike wonder, use first principles thinking to say, okay, why is this? Why is that? So, you know, why do I even get enjoyment out of a certain thing? Or why am I doing this certain habit? Because it seems like a lot of people get trapped in things, I guess, you know, maybe from your childhood, you form some habits or something dramatic happened and you're doing stuff and you don't even realize you're doing it. So you have to kind of be conscious of it. Say, okay, I keep doing this thing. I'm falling in the same trap, but it's not working for me. And then you know, they say, oh, you got to change this. So you know, people might go to psychologists or psych psychiatrists. And they say, okay, you need to change this. How do you feel this way? But no one ever says, well, why am I acting this way? Why am I doing this? What do I need to do to change? And then if I do this, why is that working? Or why is this not working for me? So I always find if you say why enough, you generally get to the answers. But you might have to ask why 100 times. But it really helps you start thinking when you say, why is this? Why does this happen? Why does that happen? Why does this person say this? Why does this person act that way? You know, why did this stock go up? Or why did this company fail? What am I learning from it? And, you know, sometimes when you go back to people buying stocks, your thesis could have been right and the stock just went down. It doesn't actually mean your thesis was wrong. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, why did this happen? Was I wrong? Did something change? Is my point of view on the world wrong? Because it seems like those who are non-consensus and right, they don't have a lot of competition in the beginning. And the world eventually comes around to their way of thinking because they were right, right on that particular subject. And then they become the big player, the big company, the big expert in that field. And they do very well. And I think, too, a lot of people, when they focus on something, start to become good at something, they start to become passionate about it, too. And it's interesting, too, because somebody might be even just learning guitar or something, but they're really passionate. Well, nowadays, you can say, hey, I'm a guitar newbie. This is how I learned. And just the basic things you learn, like YouTube videos. And I bet you that there's a group of other people who want to learn guitar and would actually feel more comfortable with you. Because when they go on YouTube and they see some big expert playing real crazy and real great, they're really intimidated. And it's really hard for them. But since you're learning and they're learning, you're just one step ahead of them. They're going to benefit by learning how you learned. And may, you may get a big following. Uh, yeah. 
I mean, I'm just thinking loud about taking initiative and in some of the things we said earlier about, you know, social media initiatives and marketing. I mean, imagine getting that dentist, that doctor, and then you have a chance to do right by them to upsell them to more and more services because you're proving your value and your worth to them to connect with them on obviously on something like a LinkedIn or something where they might have a profile and understand common connections and being able to ask their spheres of influence who would benefit and then developing that niche in that given arena and then in today's world, putting up a Facebook group dedicated to what you could do for dentists and benefiting them. There's so many things you could do that are effectively free or near free. You just have to just take the initiative. Don't be afraid to fail. It's not really failure. You're learning. And maybe the next time you'll have some practices and, and initiatives in terms of moving forward. Really important area that we're going to get to now. You know, you could be a talented creator. But if you're not digitally savvy or know someone who is that can help you, you know, it's going to be hard to succeed in today's world in those kind of side hustles and even entrepreneurship. It's not just you build it and they come. The legendary Peter Drucker actually keeps it really simple. Create, market, and sell. So some creators are not good at marketing and selling. That's a big problem. You need to be able to learn that. And that is probably something you should have also been more active in in school, but also take responsibility uh, yourself, both within the school and outside of school from some of the platforms and ways that we're explaining and probably read Peter Drucker's book. That wouldn't also be the worst thing in the world. Okay, we're going to get to it. How the world is changing so much. And you have a phrase that I love. Influencers are eating the world. What do you mean? Yeah, so it seems like influencers are really moving into all sectors of life. I mean, some of them are becoming um, advisors for certain startups, even joining venture capital funds. And hedge funds are going to start needing influencers, too, with this Reddit thing going on, because they're going to need people who understand all that. And it's just interesting, too, because now with things like TikTok, some of the main people have like over 100 million followers, 100 million. And the second person has like 70 some million, I, I believe, the last time I checked. And um, that, that's more votes than the president of the United States got 100 million. So just imagine if that person was of age and ran for president and all of their followers voted for him. They would win just based on that. I mean, it's almost like a popularity contest. These people, the influence they have is crazy. And a lot of them are wise. They're becoming owners. They're starting businesses. And they're collaborating with people who, who are in the fields that do these things like merchandise, cosmetics, things like that. And it's just like another thing, too, you know, um, let people talk about leveraging money, but really now at the influencer world, you're, you're leveraging other people's time, other people's talents, other people's resources, and taking what you do best and finding someone else who does something else well, and then leveraging the talents. I actually think in the art world with the NFTs, there's going to be a lot of collaboration, or it'll be someone who's technically gifted is going to partner with somebody who's gifted at art. And right. then there may even be somebody in art who does a different kind of art than you, and you collaborate with them, because there's actually going to be like analog to digital back to analog. So you're going to have these NFTs as incredible collection. And somebody might say, well, I really like that. I'd like to have that in my house. So then what they do is they may send in a redemption token to get that piece of art. And you'll actually then go create that piece of art physically and mail it to them. Of course, you know, they would pay you for that too. But it's just, it's just amazing the things that are going to happen. But influencers are everywhere. I mean, they're being paid, you know, 10, 20, 30, a hundred thousand dollars to be sponsored for things to talk about it on TikTok and Instagram and things like that. I mean, it's just incredible the amount of influence these people are going to have. They're going to become their own media company. Like these people's brands are going to be their own media. So it's almost disrupting me the way we know it, like you know, the newspapers. becoming the top podcasters, the people on YouTube, the top people on Instagram, the top people on TikTok. And now with Clubhouse, I think that's going to become a thing too, where people are actually just controlling their entire narrative. So it's almost like you're mm -hmm. controlling your entire narrative yourself. And um, it's going to change the way PR happens and things of that nature. You'll almost become your own PR firm where you may have your own team. So you're your own brand. You actually have your own entire team controlling the entire narrative yourself. Yeah, I mean, we're going to talk a little bit more in some of the, you know, side hustles and things like that relative to influencers, both becoming one, not that it's easy, it's not, uh, or utilizing them. We'll talk about it from a couple of perspectives. You said something that I just love. So think of TikTok, and I believe it's what Charlie D'Amelio, 
she has more followers than either Trump or Biden had votes. Now, yeah, she can't run for president. She's too young. And I'm not saying all those people would vote for her. I get it. But if you believe that the future is not heading in that direction and we're going to see more and more of that, I mean, if you don't believe that, I think you're just crazy. You're just wrong. It's happening right now. It's especially going to be more and more impactful as we move forward. Uh, and, you know, I would say from an entrepreneur's perspective, oh, but I can't afford an influencer. And you might be right if they're, now you could get a little niche their prices might have come down a little bit during COVID. And as opposed to paying them, offer them a significant piece of the action via like an affiliate link. We're gonna get to some of that shortly. Maybe they get 70, 80% and you know, boom, their team does a quick post, you get noted. Uh, you'll make money, you'll pick up more followers, and in the future, you'll have a lot more business. You have to get creative. You can't just sit back and think and hope that it's going to, quote unquote, happen for you. It's not. You got to get out there. You may fail. You learn from the experience. You limit your losses. You evolve and grow and move forward. Let's talk, because I don't want to get too negative <laughs> relative to how a lot of the younger people think about the world moving forward. There are some good things that could come out of uh, clean energy and technologies and all these things that are evolving, we may be looking at a world, if things work out on a more positive note, where energy is near free, arguably food, transportation, housing may even get dynamic with 3D printing. Since you're a futurist at heart, tell us a little bit about that and how that could be the positive way to look forward. Yeah, so I'm of the view with Wright's Law, the cost of everything keeps dropping exponentially. So I really believe that eventually transportation is going to be almost free because right, right now, the way people did it, you know, in our day is you get a driver's license, you buy a car and you don't have to buy the car, but you have the gasoline, the insurance, the upkeep, all that good stuff or bad stuff, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> and nowadays, a lot of younger people don't even get a driver's license. They're using the Ubers and, you know, they're paying, paying the fares to Uber to be transported every place they go. But I really believe the future is gonna be, there's not even gonna be a driver. So that eliminates that cost. So it's gonna be autonomous and you're gonna press a button and the um, autonomous fleet's gonna come get you and take you where you wanna go. It's gonna lower that cost. And then if it's all electric vehicles, they don't have the cost of gasoline or the driver. So that lowers their input costs. Therefore mm -hmm. your cost can be much, much lower. So the price they charge you will go down, but their margins will actually be greater and they're charging you less. So that's creating a tremendous value. And then things like food, there's a lot of debates whether or not it can be 3D printed and how good that will really be. But I do believe there will be some kind of way to um, even cloning cows and things like that so you don't have to slaughter the animals. And once they figure that out, initially those things might be really expensive, but through rights law and technology, they get that price down. So the price of food will almost be free. And I mean, you could argue now if somebody wanted to, they could go get the, like the seeds of the garden and plant them. Well, just imagine if everybody has like some kind of robot or AI and it really optimizes the crop, because I have read a lot of crop, there's a certain amount of spoilage and stuff like that. So if you could eliminate the spoilage and the waste and the stuff and really make the su supply chain more cost effective, you can lower all the costs. So that brings down the cost of the food. And then as far as the housing goes, housing, you could be 3D printing a house and there can be different kind of um, things where they repurpose malls and make these kind of group houses and the tiny house movement that's happening and really get the cost of the inputs, and the materials of the housing down. Because right now the cost of the lumber and the copper and the things that make the houses, it's going to the roof. So it actually is rising the cost. But if you can get those costs down through the supply chain and through technology, now you can lower the cost of housing greatly. And then I don't know if you mentioned education, but right now, you know, education has had a massive inflation because, you know, you have student loans and all this. But what about things like ISAs and things like that? You can get the cost of education down and even go back to, I remember back, this was before my time, people used to have an apprenticeship where they would go to work for somebody as an apprentice and actually get paid. We could even have some kind of thing where there's some kind of apprenticeship type thing where people may or may not be getting paid, but um, they're being educated without having to you know, take out $200,000 of student debt or even $40,000 or anything of that nature. And so that's going to lower the cost of education. And it is true. And it's unfortunate that disruptive technologies and innovation is going to eliminate a lot of jobs. But I believe it's also going to create new jobs because people always say, 
than the old age of the farming age. Oh my God, with the industrial age and the machines, it's eliminating all these farming jobs. What are we gonna do for work? But people had work, they had the industrial jobs. And then when the internet came along, it's just disrupting you know, the old ways of um, industry. What do people wanna do? There's not gonna be any jobs. There's plenty of new jobs, computer science, computer programmers. So I think in this next age, there are gonna still be jobs. It's just a lot of people are gonna have to be retrained or re-educated. And I get that people that are like, 50, 60, 70. And the reason I say 70 is because we're living longer and a lot of people are still going to be needing to work in their 70s. And really you should, they should at least be working at something they're passionate at, even if they don't need the money. Cause I think that helps keep you young. Just sitting around retired, you know, laying around probably gets boring. And it probably, you know, people age and don't really know it. Cause I think I listened to a thing of Tony Robbins back in the day and he did some study that a few years after people retired, they die. So, so, and I think a lot of that has to do with because they didn't keep their mind active. They didn't keep their spirits active. They just kind of withered away to nothing. So I really believe the cost of everything is going to come down exponentially in the next decade. And I think that, you know, the roaring 20s 2.0 to 2020s is going to be the greatest time in our history. And there's going to be the greatest breakthroughs made in our lifetime. You see that young ones just graduating college? It's not all bad. Be optimistic. <laughs> Get out there and simply just make it happen. And again, we need some things to happen right because there's things that could go wrong. But yeah, I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to look at the positive side of things. Uh, a, a little bit kind of quasi related. And I think we have some different opinions on this. And this is great. And that is kind of the future of cities. The New York's, the San Francisco's, LA's, London. Did COVID change things forever? Uh, you have the dynamic of hotels, retail, office space, the future of work, probably to some degree being changed forever. But these wonderful cities, and they've been wonderful for so long, they do have the opportunity for great universities often around them that draws young, smart, talented people in that want to live in those communities. Admittingly, the prices have not dropped as much as we would, some would hope in some of the communities that I noted. But they need social interaction from my experience. I don't think they want to be in what they would consider the bland and boring suburbs. And I'm not saying that's going to apply to everyone, but a lot of young people like to collaborate. They're socially interactive. And you have the collisions with people from around the world and dynamics and more artists and creative thinkers. We're going through a struggle now. There's going to need to be reinventing, including our cities and how that's going to play out and some grave concerns with social injustice, with taxes. So there are some challenges here, but I, I do think that cities will bounce back, they'll recover, and it will still be a hub for many young, highly creative people. Yeah, so I'm not 100% sure it'll go that way. I mean, I don't think the cities will go away, but I think they'll be, I hate to use the word repurpose, but there'll be a lot of change. So may, maybe New York like goes, turns into more like a Soho house type thing. But I really believe that the reason the young people want, want to go to those places and be in those places is because of convenience. So the reason to be in the city is convenience. You know, everything is right there. But with technology, you could actually be in the suburbs or somewhere else and still have the same conveniences. And as long as everybody's getting together and having their social event, you know, they call it IRL in real life, if it's wherever that is, that's where the young people want to be. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in the city. Historically, it's been in the cities, but now it could be somewhere else. I mean, you could even have out like say where there's a could go and 3D print a lot of small houses. You could have an autonomous grocery store almost, like a vehicle that drives and delivers the groceries, you press a button, there's no human, you put up your Apple phone and it does the Apple pay, pays for the groceries, but everybody's living there in their own tribe and their own community. So there'll be less need to go to the city because everything will come to you. So I really believe that the younger generation is all in to convenience and they like, you know, instant gratification. So if they can get that without the city, I don't know if they necessarily need the city. And a lot of companies are moving out of places like New York and going to Miami or Austin. And they're also moving out of California and places like that. And I, I really think when, when they move out of there, if there's no need to be there, the only reason people were in Silicon Valley was because of the network. Because, you know, through serendipity, you could run into a coffee shop, some VC or some startup company or even a big established company and get a job there just by meeting someone and forming a relationship. But now you can form the relationships via technology. I mean, things like Clubhouse and Zoom are really changing that. So you can, you can get the network and form the relationship without that. There still needs to be some in person because you learn through osmosis, but I think it's going to be kind of um, fragmented now where you have 
all these decentralized workplaces and people may work from home so many days a week, but then come to the office one or two days a week. And there may be a big company meeting at like a WeWork or someplace once a month. And people have like IRL in real life events where they get to meet all their friends and see them because I really think the habits have changed in the last year and a half that we figured out, Hey, you can do all this digitally and it keeps improving. I mean, imagine if this COVID thing shut down would have happened in the year 2006, 2005, People would have went nuts because we didn't have the technology infrastructure we have now. And the infrastructure just keeps growing and growing and getting better and better. So the better the technology gets, it's going to be less a need to have the city environment. And I think a lot of the real estate is going to be um, repurposed. A lot of the old malls are going to turn into housing or even digital data center warehouses, or they could turn into amusement parks or some kind of experience. Because it seems like the younger generation is really into experiences. So as long as you can get the experience with their friends, and their peers, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the city. And I think a lot of them have learned too, but they didn't realize before, wow, I lived in a 300 square foot apartment. Somebody told me it's actually a 100 square foot <laughs> in New York, really stuffed in. Wow. Or in San Francisco, I had to live with six roommates and I really didn't have any room. And now they realized, hey, for the same cost or less, I could be in a much nicer house or in a house even and um, have a yard, have a have a dog in the yard and things of that nature and they've grown to like this and they're like wow i really like this and as long as they still have the conveniences and can still communicate and have the experiences they don't need to be in the city anymore interesting points i suppose i could agree with some of it we'll see how that'll play out but i'm going to go with that that social serendipity of bumping in the city environment different cultures around the world I don't think that could be replicated by anything else and i do think there'll be a bounce back but the answer is who knows let's bounce around some ideas, side hustles, businesses. I'm gonna start with one, it may even be a little inappropriate, so pardon me. And during COVID, I get it, not, but as it looks like we're making some progress here with the vaccines, and I'm thinking from a young, per young person's perspective, and what I just said about their need for social interactivity and their own human growth and experiences from that. I mean, I think if I remember correctly, Elon Musk, uh, used to charge people for kind of the parties he would host in Penn. So like imagine post-COVID, 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 uh, however you define that, something like raves, will they make a comeback? Are young people itching to get out and interact? Now, renting a house on Airbnb, uh, party selling tickets, okay, that's probably not quite following the guidelines of Airbnb or zoning, I get it. And I'm not telling you to break the rules, but broadly speaking, you get the idea. So as we're coming out of this, young people are dying for interaction. Why don't you provide the opportunity to give it to them? What do you think? Yeah, I think there's going to be like a bunch of decentralized burning mans, for lack of a better term. <laughs> and it's going to be like, they're going to call them in IRL, in real life parties, where yeah, people yeah. get together and they, and they meet at these places. Maybe they rent, rent a mansion and have this big party in real life and everybody's having a good time and they're filming it on Instagram. Somebody might even be live streaming it on Twitch, like the gamers. I mean, it, it's going to be crazy because people are just going to go nuts once they get the green light. It, it's it's going to be insane. I think there's going to be a lot of that. I think also there's going to be, we're going to move to an element of social living where the younger people goes back to your city's theory. If they don't need the cities anymore, you know how they say YOLO, you only live once. They're going to want to live their best life. And there may be people renting larger houses and mansions and living together and then live streaming that social living and, and things of that nature. So that'll be how they get interact action. So, and then they'll have even on their own, like every weekend, we used to call, I think they call them meetups now, but they'll call them in real life parties or everybody will have their own meetup and they'll have a good time. And it'll just, it'll just be insane. I think it's that's really pent up demand for that. It's going to be off the charts. <laughs> yeah, it is is definitely pent up. I mean, we're right about this. I mean, I know the timing would not be great talking about it during COVID, but trust me, this is a business idea where you can make some money, engage, develop your network, completely unrelated, but something else. We hinted at it earlier is kind of if you're into finance, it, investment research. You don't need to be a financial advisor. You need to be someone who's curious and diligent and maybe has a real, real niche. We mentioned Bitcoin. We mentioned digital assets. We mentioned, or I didn't mention, but unique uh, cryptocurrencies that are not as well known or studied, Ether, but even more like Polkadot or something like that, uh, or like a Tesla. Then what you do, again, we, we spoke about it, you, you build up your niche, you work on your following, and then what could you convert to something like Substack, a subscription newsletter and subscription podcast or Patreon that people are willing to pay, even if it's really, really modest, it all adds up and your costs are going to be really, really low. 
Uh, I hinted at it, didn't go into deep detail, and this is not going to be a podcast or a video to talk too much about it, but the opportunity for affiliate links. I mentioned it from the perspective of getting an influencer to be motivated by what you're doing, but as you build up your email and your social media following, you could also uh, work with, there's a million of them, affiliate link organizations for selling a something, a product that you believe in. You don't just want to do it for the sake of doing it, but an opportunity to leverage your big following, your database, what you worked hard on and get a piece of that action. And some people do incredibly, incredibly well with something like that. Uh, you may have more experience, JJ, in terms of, my God, it's hard, but even gamers, gamers now are making money, often doing nothing more than just live streaming, how talented they are playing games and their colorful commentary, and they're building up followers. Uh, any comments about that? Yeah, it's interesting. I've noticed a lot, of, there's, there's a big rise of everyone having their newsletter on Substack, and a lot of them have like, I call it the freemium model. So they might have a basic, every now and then they send free content. And then if you want the paid stuff, you'll either get it sooner than the rest of the group or you'll get stuff that wasn't covered. It's just like some of the YouTubers might make a video and they say, but if you want like the special video or the extra information, then subscribe to my Patreon or something of that nature to get that. You right. get special perks. So you have your, your free stuff and then you have the paid for, which is the special perks that some number of your followers is going to want. And let's dive into another one, which again, it's, it's, you know, not everything is going to be white collar and Elon Musk for side hustles or to, to build legitimate businesses where you have freedom of your life and control. Uh, like let's use, and we spoke about it before, something like a, a side hustle as a personal trainer, a fitness trainer. One, it would help to be living and looking the part, especially since you're probably going to want to be active on social media with it. It's very low cost in terms of doing it, but it is time consuming and it's probably wickedly inefficient. If you're working one-on-one, -on -one, maybe what, 50, $60 an hour, depending on what part of the country, a variety of different factors that may not be overly scalable and it may be inefficient and that might be okay. If you're able to do that multiple hours per week and something you love where you're actually helping people and then you're saving that, you're building up your network, meaning saving the money and then you're investing properly, that absolutely could be valuable. But let's take that to a little bit of an other level. What could they do? What would you recommend? I'm assuming it's going to be producing visual content on YouTube, et cetera. How could they take that to another level? Yeah, so somebody's like a yoga teacher or a personal trainer, they could even do like Zoom classes. That way, you know how when you're doing personal training, it's just you and one person. That's just you and one person. But you can right. leverage that if you have you know, up to 500 people, I guess, could be in a Zoom thing, but you can even just have, say, 30, even like a relatively small class and get paid on 30 people. And maybe you're not charging $60 a person, but $60 for one person is $60. If you have 30 people and you're charging $10 a person, you know, that, that's $300. And maybe you'll get a larger class and make even more. And then you can leverage that by doing lives on things like TikTok and Instagram Live. And um, on TikTok, there's actually ways people can gift people so you can make money off of that. And then just by getting your content out there with TikTok, eventually, if you have a large enough following, you're going to have people who make fitness items that want you to do a sponsored video on YouTube or TikTok or Insta, depending on how many followers you have, and you get paid for that. So, yeah, so like now, now, now you're getting paid in, ma in many ways. And it's not just like, you know, your time, you only have so much time. So if you're training one person one-on-one, -on -one, you're making your 50 or $60 for that hour. But if you can leverage that time and make hundreds of dollars, I mean, it's exponential. That's the magic in terms of how to do it. But I know you got to start somewhere. You know, to me, producing great visual content, YouTube, Instagram, and absolutely TikTok, I think that will be important, really important. Building your brand awareness in terms of what you stand for from that perspective. I love the paid Zoom idea uh, and kind of doing the classes. You could exponentially leverage your time and your efficiencies with that. With a little bit of dough, I'd consider Facebook groups promoting your TikTok or Patreon pages relative to your exercise, diet, fitness advice, and all that. And, and, and you would have some familiar with this. I would recommend also posting. There's Facebook fitness groups in your community and globally. There's Reddit. There's Quora. Uh, there's a variety of different things that you could do that are effectively free. And yes, some of them will cost money, some of the ads and stuff like that. But you got to take the initiative. Now, you want to take that to another level. 
then you know, offer products in health and wellness and develop affiliate agreements, what I said earlier, that fit into that fitness realm and what you're, you're noting, and I hate to use the word promoting, but on Instagram, on TikTok, those are all things that could be valuable. Now, let's talk, since we're diving into this one a little deeply, there also is going to be a little bit of a negative moving forward and that, as you know, there's wearables now and clothing and all that that are going to provide specific guidance to people on various exercises so that that one on one, maybe three to five or five to seven years out, it may get harder and harder. You can't just keep on doing what you're doing that may be doing OK as a side hustle. You may have to do some of the other things we're talking about and become a brand influencer. And I'm not saying that's easy. But if you keep on doing what you're doing, that is an example where technology in that arena may make it more difficult. Right, I think that's where like the Zoom classes and things like that, the live Zoom classes comes into play because um, one of the main reasons a lot of people would want to keep a trainer if they're used to that or yoga classes because it, get, it gets them off their butt and like a kick in the pants to actually do it. Because I think a lot of people might get lazy and they would stop doing their exercise and stop doing their yoga. So they really need like the positive peer pressure of people they even met on Zoom if there's an interactive way to say, hey, where the hell were you? You missed yoga last Thursday. So then they keep on going and they keep with it. Or the same even with some kind of personal weight training or something like that through Zoom, things of that nature. It almost becomes like a tribe in itself or the community. It goes back to where you were talking about people wanting to be social in the cities. Well, now people are learning, hey, we can even be social via Zoom or things of that nature via technology. Sure, we're going to still want to meet in real life and do things in real life too. But there's also that social aspect. So social has taken on a, new, a whole new definition. But I, I really think though, even the wearables and stuff are going to um, be great because it's going to be a guide. But now your trainer can say, okay, everybody monitoring their wearable is your heart rate, what it's supposed to be. Oh, you need to get your heart rate up to a certain amount, whatever they think it should mm -hmm. be. And then everyone looks at their um, wearable and make sure they get their heart rate. And then it even becomes a competition. Hey, so-and-so couldn't, couldn't get their heart rate up to it, but I got mine. So it inspires other people to hit their goals too. So I think there's always going to be a need for the instructors. It'll just be, they need to leverage technology. Yeah, that's a good point. And then really the ultimate to make the bigger box, which you hinted at is kind of, and it's not easy. You need the right number of followers and you have to work and really make that happen is to become kind of that fitness influencer for lack of a better word. Remember influencers are eating the world that we spoke about. And then you get the opportunity to sell merch uh, and get paid for sponsorship videos. And that's where larger dollars and revenue could come in. You know, think big. I mean, maybe you do end up falling short, but aim for the moon. Maybe you hit the sky as opposed to aim to the top of your head and you're successful. Thinking big and being confident and proactive is going to be really, really important to make any of this work. I mean, other things that we spoke about earlier was kind of, you know, be that social media influencer on old analog type solo entrepreneurs and businesses. And there's a gazillion out there. They don't know this stuff. TikTok, you got to be kidding me. They know nothing about it. They're 23. They're probably too old for it. So you have an opportunity in terms of doing something with that. Uh, how about, it's vague, so you may have to really dive deeply into this, but how about a little, someone who is a little bit more tech savvy, they have an idea and they want to do something like an app, is creating an app. Is that something where the cost of creating that but then how do you market and sell it? It's not just getting it on the app store. If no one knows about it and it has no buzz, that's not going to do anything. What would you recommend to them? Right. So if somebody wants to build, build an app and they're, and they're good with technical things, they certainly can code the app and then get it on the app store and things of that nature, as long as it fits all the terms of service. But then they have to get users. So that goes back to marketing and influence where you have to get people using the app and then you get feedback, what people like, what people don't like, you know, fix the bug, because there's always going to be bugs when you first release it. And then just build up the user base, you know, daily active users, things of that nature. But you really have to get the users. So that goes into marketing and influencers and things like that. And it seems like now that the world of influencers, too, things are moving to memes. So memes is really becoming a big thing. I, sure. I'm really starting to think, wow, these, me these memes is really going to unlock something. We may even all have our own meme one day. Like a successful business is going to have its own meme. Certain things are just becoming successful because of the meme. Like Dogecoin, for instance, that was actually supposed to be a joke. And it became real big because everybody liked the meme of Shiba. And it's really, mm -hmm. and that was, I think Dogecoin was created like in 2014, if my memory serves correctly. 
And, you know, now in 2021, it's really, really taken off. Elon Musk keeps tweeting the meme. And he's even making his own memes of himself and, and Shiba. So that, that's really catching on. And then GameStop has become a meme and AMC has become a meme. And I mean, Wall Street bets to become a meme. I mean, everything's starting to really become a meme. So that's really going to become something. Yeah, like we mentioned things before, like becoming fluid on digital assets in the world of finance, uh, maybe matching art with NFTs and other things happening in digital assets relative to being an influencer from that perspective. A little bit more classically in my arena would be, you know, someone again, who's in classic finance, maybe they do want to be quote unquote, a hedge fund manager. So they start by, it would help to be working for one to be quote unquote on Wall Street, if that is still a thing, develop that experience, make money, work on your career, have an opportunity to dive deeper into research, what would you do differently? And effectively, you're your own prop trader. Uh, you're investing money as well yourself, have the opportunity to develop and get the experience. This is not something you may necessarily walk into. Yeah, you want to be that college kid, what about 30 years ago, Ken Griffin, uh, who got the million dollar investment from a legendary seed investor. And then basically in his college dorm room, that's how Citadel, the legendary hedge fund was born. Uh, you know, these are all things, be, be big, think big, be bold, have the opportunity, put it to work. What could you do? Save money. You got a hundred. Now you got a thousand, you got 10,000, 50,000. How are you doing on your investing? Are you just being a broad beta investor or are you being really strategic in your research and what you're doing is working? And then maybe you have the opportunity to build that out from there and be that Mr. or Mrs. or Miss whatever, two and 20 quote unquote hedge fund manager. I mean, the, how would you look at that from a young person looking to get into the world of finance or even to become an angel in VC? What are things they could do to get the experience and then start to take their own initiative? Yeah, they definitely can do a lot of research just watching YouTube videos, videos like this. Mm -hmm. And you know, they, they can do reading, they can read even stuff on Reddit and things of that nature, look on social media now, because it seems like even a lot of the VC firms now have understood, hey, we have to have our own social media presence. We have to have our own brand. We have to have our own this to appeal to the startups to want to take money from us. Because the best, there's so much money sloshing around the system right now that the best companies are getting money thrown at them. It's like super haves and have nots. There are some companies that can literally raise tens to hundreds of millions just like that. And then there's other companies that struggle to raise. So the top tier firms get to see all the, the best deals and they get to choose which ones they want. But even now, some of the um, things that happened, like when Clubhouse came out, you know, they, they got funded. I believe the majority investment was from um, Andreessen Horowitz, but there were mm -hmm. probably other VCs that wanted to get in that deal. But for whatever reason, they went with Andreessen Horowitz, who has, you know, its own media team, has its own team of previous operators to help you right. build your company and work on things. So even then, at every level, you have to differentiate yourself and be like, why am I valuable to you? Yeah, I mean, you always have to do that. I mean, we're going to kind of take it a bit to the home stretch now. And again, there's nothing wrong with working for companies, getting the experience, developing a successful career, being open-minded, being a lifelong learner, knowing how to properly have discipline to save money. And effectively, like I said, you'll have enough assets over time that may very well surpass your earnings from income. And that's gonna give you the power, but that's gonna come from improving yourself so your earnings go up and then you have the discipline of savings and making the right decisions, especially longer term on investing. Some may augment that with side hustles, especially earlier in their career. Some of those side hustles may take off. Maybe you're someone who's good at creating businesses and not as much the nitty gritty of running them. So you bring in a partner that may not be ultra creative, but is good at operating and you split it, or maybe you even go down to 10 or 20% and let them run with the whole thing, but 10 or 20% of nothing that you just started and took off, you know, that's gonna matter. And yes, yeah, some of you will become incredible entrepreneurs, bootstrapping from nothing, and that's great. Any one of these things could work. I think the opportunity to think big, be bold, uh, have an opportunity to be very, very open-minded. And like you said, what Wayne Gretzky, skate to where the puck is headed. What might have worked even three years ago, 15, 20 years ago, may very well not work now. The world is changing. Look at the technology and all that's occurring. Look at this, there's so many different factors coupled with COVID-19 and all the implications that that is bringing. You know, take a breath, 
know how to be cool and calm during a, a time of crisis and have the opportunity, you get your whole life ahead of you, uh, especially when you're young like that. You could afford to fail, to make mistakes. And I could care less if you're living in your parents' basement, if you're working hard and you're saving money and putting it to work. You know, to me, that actually might even be a good move in the short term relative to the challenges that we have now. Why don't I give the floor a little bit to you as kind of a close, JJ, then I'll take it home and we're all done. Yeah, I, I just go back to, you know, we're living in the greatest times ever. And um, I know like the, the media seems to like to make everything sound like it's the end of the world, you know, gloom and doom, this, that, and the other, but that's not, not really true. And even a lot of the younger generation is realizing, hey, there's hope, just the way they all banded together on Reddit. And they, they discovered things like GameStop and, you know, previously Tesla and previously Bitcoin that um, there is definitely a group of young people who are very positive and they don't get the credit they deserve. I think the media kind of puts a spin on them or some of the older adults make it sound like everything is negative and their, and their future is grim, but that's not true because if you have a positive attitude, no matter what time we're in, relative to the time that you're living, you can become one of the best people at something as long as you put your focus on it and you're determined. And then when you get knocked down, just keep on going because everybody gets knocked down. Even like the most successful billionaires you see on TV, like for instance, for sure. Tesla, Elon Musk, who's now the richest guy on record on Forbes, Tesla almost went out of business many times. I mean, there were so many doubters and haters and he just kept fighting through. And always when it seemed like he was on the cusp of the abyss, he always found a way to keep one going. So it's the people who are resilient and learn, they find a way to keep one going and they don't get knocked down and they keep moving forward. It's just like, you know, the Super Bowl is coming up tomorrow and Patrick Mahomes said he learned from his dad, he used to be a major league baseball player, that players have to make plays. So whenever something goes wrong, you just move on, forget about that old play and the next play is your focus and just keep moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I would say to kind of bring that up even a little bit as well, the young people that I see today, you're incredibly talented, you're socially aware, you care about things. And I think there's much to look forward to. It's never going to be easy. It's going to be a struggle. Take the gumption, be someone who's able to be gritty, understand that the things that we're talking about, there's amazing potential ahead of you, but you got to take that action. You can't just sit back. It's not going to come to you. You got to be the one who's going to be proactive. Uh, now, yeah, your resumes have to get a little better. I mentioned about how boring <laughs> many of them are, but hopefully directly or indirectly, we gave you some tips about that to showing that you're a self-starter, to, to making the phone call, not just sending it in, to pushing the envelope, to seeing where you have a connection to a connection, being active. And yeah, there's just no way around that social media and being an influencer in that whole realm, that's gonna be, that's not, it's not gonna retract, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna grow and grow. And you wanna have an advantage of that. And that also could be incredibly profitable from multiple different perspectives. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of the Angelo Robles podcast on Apple and Spotify and at very active on YouTube under my brand of Simply Family Office. So it's pretty easy to find me. I'm the founder and CEO at Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to successful families, investors, and their family offices. We provide lots of content and resources. And part of this was spurred by the children of our members. We used to run entrepreneurship programs where we would bring in great uh, startup investors and others and children of our members would work in that ecosystem or learn or hear them. We used to do different tracks and physical events on it. And hopefully some of that will start to come back a little bit later this year. But we are, you know, no matter whether rich or poor, just these are principles that are gonna be valuable to many of you, I hope, if you listen to it, watch it over and over again. And then effectively at the end of the day, just do it, take action. Everyone, it's time for me to say goodbye. I'd like to give a special thank you again to JJ Sowers, who is fantastic as always. Uh, for those that may wanna learn a little more, I don't know whether it's your social media, your Twitter, did you wanna give anything a bit of a shout out? Yeah, so on TikTok, I'm at the Asian Cowboy and um... On Twitter, I'm at Primal Key. All right. Who could forget that? And although you're super fluid on some of the big benefits of it, I know you're not someone who promotes that or puts much effort into it. You've been very successful in other ways, so that hasn't been a core focus of yours. But damn, do you know it inside and out. 
Well, again, everyone, I'm Angelo Robles. You can follow me on Family Office on YouTube. I am active as Family Office as well on Twitter and Family Office Association on Instagram. May rebrand that to my personal name or a variation of it. We'll see. Not that important. In other words, you could find me. Don't worry about it. Angelo at FamilyOfficeAssociation.com and 203-570-2898. Thank you so much. JJ, great job as always. Have a great day. Thanks.